I'm Dave Cauley, investigative journalist and host of the podcast, Cold. In October of 1985, a woman named Cherie Warren left work at a busy Salt Lake City office. To meet her estranged husband at a downtown auto dealership. She never made it home. Cherie's car surfaced weeks later in Las Vegas. In the parking lot of a hotel casino. No one knows how it got there. Strange. It was strange. Both Cherie's estranged husband and her boyfriend raised suspicion for investigators. I kind of thought that he might have done something. But no arrests were ever made. In Cold Season 3, we dig into double lives, make new connections in the case, and examine the difficulty raised by reasonable doubt. We want answers just as much as anyone else. They have creeps like that now, too, so nothing's changed. That's the new Cold Season 3, The Search for Cherie. Now available anywhere you get your podcasts. It's both been 365 days since we've done yard work. I quit doing yard work. He quit yeah. doing yard yeah, work. Yeah, solidarity yeah. all the way. <laughs> yeah, I want to get in on that. Yeah. Yeah. You want to join? Yeah. The Scott motto is never sweat on purpose. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's, that's not good. So, Dad, I, I, and I think that's where it gets muddy, you know, because on one hand, you're, the attic is saying, you know, we were saying, hey, you can't do it unless you want to. Mm-hmm. But then on the other hand, it's affecting everybody around you. Right. So they do have some skin in the game. And I think a lot of people come to me and they write on Facebook and, and they want to talk about it. They've got a loved one who needs help and they don't know where to start. But, I mean, it, it just it, it muddies the water because they do have a problem. And I think that's where boundaries need to come in. And I don't think we talk enough about boundaries. Mm-hmm. And boundaries, like he said, it doesn't mean I don't love you. I do love you. And sometimes saying I love you means walking away setting a boundary yeah, yeah absolutely you know and i'm not walking away because i don't love you and i don't want the best things for you i just i can't be a part of this because i love you that much right and to take that just kind of a, a little step further if you're the spouse who has children to look over and protect and and you, you know you might have to say look you we all have a drinking problem here and i can't control yours but i can help the kids and sometimes boundaries need to be set when there. When that was happening with Casey, you know, he said, well, my wife wants me to quit drinking. Okay. Probably a good move. This was long ago. He said, well, you know, and uh, if we're going to get a divorce. It's not working out. I said, well, then quit drinking. That'll solve it. Quit drinking. You know. Well, uh, uh, but I really love her. No. If you really loved her, you'd quit drinking. So don't blame her that this isn't working out. She's got to the point where she's tired of it. It's not her deal. Your kids don't understand it. Your family doesn't understand it. The problem with family is that everybody's smart and everybody knows stuff. So those little interventions always come across as just a beat down. Yeah. You know, you're going to go, wait a minute. Okay. Let's let's not look into your closet and on your little habits and and, and your addictions to whatever it is, from chocolate ice cream to down to whatever it is. We well, so you can forget all that and tell somebody else who is so blatant, which was Casey at the time, that it's hard. Okay, and there's a shame associated with that. When you talked about going to, into AA, okay, it reminds you of the scarlet letter. Mm-hmm. You mm-hmm. show up and you have to admit. And then went, Hold on, stand there right there. We're going to sew this red A on your chest. What does that say? It says you're a loser. Mm-hmm. You're a drunk. Okay, You're not respected in society. And you go, wait a minute. And so I want you to stand up every day and tell everybody what a loser you are. Yeah. You know, <laughs> couldn't I just stand in front of a Mack truck? This, I mean, this is, this is difficult, and this is really, really hard. Right. And so those are the things that say, wait a minute. That's not how to solve this. Okay, as to, but the families are ashamed. They are ashamed. I was ashamed of them. Sure. And it's hard because it's, you want so, them so much for your kids, and when it doesn't pan out, you start saying, where did I go wrong? Why? Well, and you said you tried this, and then you tried that. You tried you know, loving him. You tried setting boundaries. I think a lot of times that the shame is there, but also a discouragement. You know, after a while, a family just doesn't know what to do while the person is still persisting in their abuse of of a substance. I think what the family can do is really, and I think what society needs to do, is get an education. Because I think the days of standing up in a 12-step room 
and you know for somebody on the outside going i'm a loser i'm doing this for me when i was in that room i was in a room of 200 people who were just like me that couldn't figure it out and so some people and we've had people on the podcast talk about the anonymous part of aa being the worst part about it because that it just perpetuates the stigma mm-hmm. of mm-hmm. a dirty dirty deal or secret mm-hmm. but if, if if you stand up and go look hey look i'm a I'm sorry, and I know what I've done in the past was not good, and I'm not, not trying to discount it, but I'm working towards fixing that and fixing myself and making myself whole. That's what we need to do is educate people. And it's it's not somebody, you know, the, the reasons for people drinking are many. And for me, you know, there were certain things that, that led to that, and then yeah. it becomes a problem. But I needed to tell everybody that – that I'm broken and that I want to fix it. I, yeah. I didn't want to be a guy that would go hide in a room with 200 well, people. Yeah, the problem was you're good at hiding things. Mm-hmm. You have a great outward personality and you could hide all those things. I think education is hugely important. I like what you were saying about the doctor who who talked to you about why your dad couldn't stop drinking. And your dad and, and Randall Carlisle both kind of said the same thing. They need to get up and start with a shot in the morning just to kind of even out. But he said, you know, he can't stop and maybe can't even stop without help right now. He can't stop for anyone else. I think what we don't understand is the physiology of addiction in our culture yet. It's right there. We're on the cusp. There's a lot more talk about it. There's a lot more good research. But we still, unfortunately, sometimes bring it back. Behavior creates the change, right? Mm -hmm. You You have to change your behaviors to become sober. But... I think it's really important for, for especially families and friends of people who struggle with addiction to understand the physiology of it so you can say, oh, it, it isn't a lie when they say they can't stop for you. There is a physiological component. Now, beha- it's, it's, it's so complicated because you have the physiology that's driving the addiction, but then you also have behavior, and the behavior has to change in order to improve the physiology. It's a complicated relationship. But if we only emphasize the behavior, then it often comes back to this, cho- it's just a choice, and we blame. Well, and we need, to, we need to change that attitude. The other thing, too, is that if you don't drink and you've never drank... It's easy to, you know, oh, to sure. point somebody out and go, oh, my God, how dumb. Well, because you've never drank. And mm-hmm. so I'm not saying that that's right. But they have no point of reference. Yeah. And they just find it appalling. You know, mm-hmm. I would say to Casey, I said, why are you doing this? Mm-hmm. You know, and, and I said, you know what? You're not funny anymore. I've been sitting in this golf cart with you for two hours, and you're not funny. Mm-hmm. Okay? You're annoying. <laughs> this, is, this is not going any. Why are you doing this? And yeah. he's trying to be whatever. And he said, you're just chasing it now, and it's not there. And so if you're telling me you drink to be whatever, Woody, I've seen you funny, but you were sober. Yeah. Or mostly sober. Yeah. Okay? But you don't drink yours. Nobody drinks themselves funny. No one drinks themselves creative. Right. The problem in Casey's instance, and it was in mine, I think my father's, is that when you're up all the time, and you're counted on. Okay? The day that Casey would show up and to go on TV and have nothing to say, I mean, there would be ripples across the valley. What am I? He is not, not entitled to have a bad day, not entitled to have his feelings hurt, not entitled to have all the things that everybody else in the world's get. You've got to be there. You've got to be on top. You've got to be sharp. And you've got to entertain me. I woke up, and now you need to entertain me. Mm-hmm. And throughout his career I mean his friends go yeah I wish you had your job you just show up you work eight <laughs> you work 18 minutes a day this is that <clears throat> and no one thinks about where you're going and how much you've worked in the background to be success you just walk up and you say a couple of funny things and they pay you and that's just not right right but, but that's being, not true. That doesn't happen. But being creative and being funny, no matter where you are emotionally, and he was going through a divorce, where you are, yeah. there's the pressure now. You have to do it. And that's escapism. Whether it worked or not, that's... It didn't. That, that's, yeah, there's a yeah. doubt. Okay. Yeah. But did it alleviate some of the pain? Probably. Okay. But it didn't alleviate it. It just postponed it. Yeah. Prolonged it. Prolonged it. When I wake yeah. up in the morning, then... You have okay. to repress it. Yeah, and, and then, yeah. Mm, okay, now what am I going to do? And yeah. so, yeah, so it's a difficult situation. Oh, yeah, everything, uh, and and I, I think Casey has endeared his fans to him. They're not just fans, but most of his fans that I'm aware of are just, they really love Casey. But the reality is uh, fans are fickle, and you have a couple bad times on the TV or on radio, and you're done. Yeah. And, and the management knows that, and so you're right, there's no... There's no margin of error. You have to be on 100% no matter 
what's going on in the rest of your life. And I think, you know, that's a pressure that most people don't understand because from the outside, if you're, if you're just naively looking at it, it looks like an easy job. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And there's jobs that are not critical and not dependent on your personality. Well, most jobs you have time to think. Well, yeah. let me think about that. I'll, yeah, you know, I'll get well, back you know, to you. If I don't get this done, I'll do it tomorrow. Right. Mm, okay. Yeah. No. But and this, this is, on-air it's, stuff. It's instant on, and you better have it. And if you yeah. don't, because yeah. I was on the radio, and I was having a bad day. People go, what's wrong with you? Uh-huh. What? How come you're not fun? I, hey, I'm, leave me alone. Yeah. I'm, <laughs> I have a when headache. it's live. I don't this, whatever. Mm-hmm. And it's tough. And you've got to be on mm-hmm. all the time. And no one understands Right, the pressure that puts you put upon yourself to be just that person, and I think unfortunately that perpetuates the abuse of alcohol and other substances because you have that repression of emotional stress, and you uh, get off the air, and it's still there, or it's even worse. It, the The pressures build up. I often, with clients, use the analogy of a like a birthday party balloon. We've all blown that balloon up to where if we keep blowing, what's going to happen? Pop. Yep, and so you've got to learn a healthy way to let that pressure out so that you, so that balloon can be its balloon. Otherwise, you destroy it. And I think emotionally, we're a lot like that. And how do we pop? We don't literally pop, but we might pop pills. We might drink. We might do a lot of maladaptive behaviors, and that's how we pop if we don't learn how to handle that pressure. Or to take your balloon analogy a little bit further, you've, all, you've taken a balloon home from a party, and you've put it in your house, and after five days, it, you know, it sinks it, down. And it, gets, and it gets just, it's not as vibrant, it's not there, mm-hmm. and I think that's what was happening to my life. Um, to bring it back, Dad, to your dad, how, you know, because you grew up with an alcoholic fa- father, you mm-hmm. had an alcoholic son. How did it end for your dad? Um, I finally moved away and came to Utah. Uh, uh, Klamath Falls was just, it was painful to be around. And I had a job offer from KLO Radio, which was up in Ogden, 50,000 water. And, and they offered me, a, I was on the radio station at a, at a station, and between records, a phone rings, and a guy offers me a job. And I'm, how did you hear about me? Eh, word gets around, they thought you were funny, though. Okay. So I came out here, so I didn't see him. <clears throat> so after that time he was there, that was the last time I saw him. Mm. And then um, he was working in Northern California uh, out of the business because he'd blown that chance. Mm-hmm. And uh, I got the phone call. I was gone over to, really a sad story, I because uh, I got drunk. Um, I was uh, very big in the March of Dimes charity up in Ogden. And my radio station was... So big supporter for that. And I was asked to come over and speak to a conference in Denver. And and I was the keynote speaker and such and such. And as I'm having dinner, uh, the waiter comes up and goes, Mr. Scott, and he hands me this little sticky note and says, call home. And I went, hmm. And uh, so I called home, and my wife is crying, Casey's mom, and said, uh, you're Dad got up from the kitchen table, opened the door, and collapsed to the floor, and he was out for 25 minutes, not breathing, until they resuscitated him. So uh, so the prognosis is he's not going to make it because he was brain dead, probably. And so the first time in my life, I didn't make the call. I didn't show up. I just walked down the hall. There was a liquor store, and I grabbed a bottle and went to my room. Oh. And I drank half of it and passed out and feeling sorry for myself and the big loss and whatever else. Um, and the, which was a dumb deal. And, but I went, um, some of my friends booked me on a flight and I went to, to, to where he was and I spoke at his funeral and whatever else. Um, but I never saw him again. And, and that was the other thing was that we had harsh words, you know, because I was embarrassed by him. Okay. On that trip. On that trip. Yeah. And that was the last time I saw him. And, you know, I said, I want to, thanks for having you make such a great impression on my wife and my kids. You know, because yeah. why does grandpa talk funny? And oh, Lord, and it was embarrassing. It yeah, was, it was tough. So, and he was only fifty fifty eight when he died. And wow. there was a heart problem and some other things that that had been involved. But something that Casey said was, I had a friend who has a son who drinks, and uh, he asked me to talk to him one day, and I said okay. And I think one of the things that may be helpful to people is that. In talking to him, he was he was uh, all everything in school, and then one day he graduated, and there was nothing left. It didn't matter anymore. It's like, what? I used to be somebody, and now I'm not. And then he got into drugs and so forth, and then he would go out and do certain things, and then he was everybody's favorite guy. Okay. 
And the feeling that I had was when I talked to him, I said, do you know you these things, these setbacks, these problems? And you can tell me because you're in the business. But my philosophy was that the disappointments in your life create holes inside you. And if you don't go back and fill them up, you will collapse. Mm-hmm. So you have to find ways to do that. So if you're insufficient in this, how are you going to fill that hole? Well, then I will try to be this over here to compensate. Yeah. And then, the oh, well, now the applause is back because I'm doing a better job. Oh, yeah, cool. And that filled that hole up. But I really think that there's where what a parent can actually do or somebody in recovery says, look, these are the holes in you. Okay, and you're yeah. caving in. You need you need to feel good about yourself, and you've got to figure out what those holes are, and how we're going to find a way to make that better. So that's not what you go back to. That's not where you feel sorry for yourself. Mm-hmm. Well, I don't. This doesn't happen for me anymore. Okay, so let's figure out a way. You can't get that back. So let's find right. something else that provides that provides and that. that enjoyment. Hey, you're listening to Project Recovery. More with my dad coming up. I'm Dave Cauley, investigative journalist and host of the podcast, Cold. In October of 1985, a woman named Cherie Warren left work at a busy Salt Lake City office. To meet her estranged husband at a downtown auto dealership. She never made it home. Cherie's car surfaced weeks later in Las Vegas. In the parking lot of a hotel casino. No one knows how it got there. Strange. It was strange. Both Cherie's estranged husband and her boyfriend raised suspicion for investigators. I kind of thought that he might have done something. But no arrests were ever made. In Cold Season 3, we dig into double lives, make new connections in the case, and examine the difficulty raised by reasonable doubt. We want answers just as much as anyone else. They have creeps like that now, too, so nothing's changed. That's the new Cold Season 3, The Search for Cherie. Now available anywhere you get your podcasts. And I think that that's a great way to look at it. It's a, it's a really good description. And I think that the, the key where uh, a therapist or someone, you know, that's there trained to help you can help a person identify what those holes are because they may have been using substances for many decades to cover that up. They don't even really know where those feelings of inferiority and security lie. They just know they don't feel good about who they are. And so they do these compensatory behaviors to try to cover it up, but it eventually catches up with everybody. I think the thing that people need to understand, though, and, I, and, you, and you mentioned it, and I agree with that, it's a physical deferment. It's a problem. It's things that they can't right. control. I can't imagine anyone, and I've been around for a long, long time, I can't imagine anyone says, I think I'll just throw my wife away. You know what would really be cool? I think I'll get on heroin and yeah. just make everybody hate me, and I'll just be living in a whatever. And I just want to throw my life away because yeah. it's going to be so great, you know, or I'm going to be drunk all the time and right. slurring and falling down, and I'll just be. No one chooses that. Right. Okay? Somehow it grabs them and drags them under. Yep. Okay. And what starts is very. Uh, I will give you a prime example, and I'm to this day now because of 365 days for me. I will watch TV, and I'm amazed at the number of commercials on TV that are selling beer and alcohol. Mm. And everybody's smiley and great and shiny, and they're all having a great time. And it seems like they're not, all fit, too. Yeah, yeah, and fit. And, <laughs> and they're the women, going to a country concert after 10. <laughs> and, the, and the women are all hot. And you kind of go, yeah. it's, you're almost getting the message that if you do not drink, uh-huh. This is not going to be your realm. No. This is where the fun people are. This is where the pretty people are. And if you don't drink, you're going to stand out and you're going to not score, you loser. Yep. So, And I'm going, there's our society, that the world, the television is just predicated mm-hmm. on nothing but alcohol, you know, and hey, you know. And the people making those commercials know what they're doing. They're, they, they suck you in. They, it feels fun. And bef- even with that knowledge that this is a fantasy it's kind of fun watching those commercials. Well, people don't realize that there's a there's an impending doom there. Oh, yeah. And then it starts, and you're into it, and then, okay, then it becomes your answer for everything. Yeah. And then when they, it's, yeah. They need to take overdone. those 20-somethings and then do a commercial of them 10 years later with beer guts and Yeah, no teeth attractive. and sit in a really dingy <laughs> bar, you yeah. know, eating peanuts and, you know, yeah. And say, yeah. I and mean, but to be, because to, I've always said I was going to be honest on this, to be fair. Okay. You know, I mean, I, I, we're, we're taking that to an extreme. But there's a lot of people out there that who 
can drink normally and have a good time. I, you, you, yeah, you, that's you, true. You, you know what I mean? I, I, and that's what I, I want to say. The moderate drinker. The, the moderate drinkers. Sure. I remember when I, right, when I got out of rehab, my mom goes, listen, we won't have alcohol at the parties anymore. And I said, mom, that's, that's great. I said, do you have a problem drinking? She says, no. I said, then I, I would rather you guys maintain your way of life because mm-hmm. this is a problem that I have. Yeah. And, and and I'm not defending drinkers, but I'm not also I'm not also condemning them because there's a lot of people out there right. that manage it. Sure. There, there's there's a, there's a large portion out there of people who can't and, and end up in situations similar to mine and ruin lives right. and, and, and take lives and, and and do bad things. But yeah. there's a certain amount of people who yeah. seem to be able to do it. And, and that's for sure the truth, absolutely. Um, and fortunately, I think m- more people, most of the people who drink don't end up with the with an alcoholic history like like you've had i think what i'm taking away from what your dad is saying is that it's kind of like the anti-education these commercials kind of dilute our ability to teach young people what the risks are yeah and and it and it, it it promotes this fantasy no i agree with that 100 well, and, and all I that and so, let's just take smoking for example sure okay you smoke, whatever the deal is, okay, you're great. And then one day you start developing this cough. And you go, ooh, this can't be good. And it doesn't go away. And pretty soon they say, well, we've been telling you for years, you smoke, you're going to get lung cancer, you an idiot. Okay. But there's that warning sign. Yeah. When right. you drink, yeah. there's no caution up ahead. Look, there's no warning signs. There's right. nothing. Okay. I'm just having a good time. This is my life. We get together. We have a few beers. Okay. Okay. And then one day, without that warning sign, you've crossed over the hill, and now you've got a problem. But there were no warning signs. And what you thought you could control, you can't control. And then you're going to blame people for it. And you really can't because there were no cautionary signs. Yeah. Okay? So as an adult or as a parent or somebody else, you say, hey, hey, you got to stop. Hey, those are, your, those are the cautionary signs that everybody needs. Sure. And said, hey, this isn't working out. And helping us know that, uh, who you know, do we really talk about it in our families? You guys are having a great discussion here. We're talking about three generations, and you just in a few minutes you've talked about all three of your alcohol use and how you've drank. But do most families do that? Do you understand if you have alcoholism in your family history that you're, these kids you're raising are at higher risk for alcoholism? I think a lot of families, that maybe especially in our culture here in Utah, don't talk about that very much. Well, or I, I, they may not have a history of family drinking. Or know and, about. And, and that they would know about because they abstain. Well, I had but, a family yeah. history. And the funny thing you mentioned, and you were mentioned earlier in the program, I was the president of the Weber Club in Ogden, which was a bar. Mm. And, and I was starting to drink because I was there in the club a lot, and I was a president involved in all this stuff. And one day I went, what are you doing? Your dad was a drunk. Your dad's dead. He got 58. And you're in here. I went, you know what? You need to uh, So I quit drinking. F- and, and he mentioned it. And it's kind of a scam, and it's not. Because mm-hmm. you think it's, a, it's not a really good litmus test. But I said, so I didn't drink for a month. And I drank tonic water with a twist of lime in it. Mm-hmm. And joined the party. Hey, how are you? Good to see you. And I walked around when I was there, and I had a drink in my hand. But I didn't drink alcohol for 30 days. And somebody said, why did you do that? And I said, because of my father... I need to know that I can stop, Mm -hmm. and I need to know that I can stop on a dime. Today is that day I'm not drinking for the next 30 days. And then if I decide to drink after that, I will. And if I don't, I won't. And it's no big deal. And then I drank casually after that. But that 30 days really slowed it down for me. Yeah, and that was so. When you alluded to that, mm-hmm. that's there's something that's there. But there yeah. is no class to teach you to drink like a gentleman, and I don't right. think a lot of parents do. Down like for me, when I was fourteen, <clears throat> I got into drinking in secrecy because we were stealing beers from the party. Sure, we were. You know, we were I had doing to explain that. to him that we left vodka in the freezer, and I said, you know, vodka's alcohol, and it. It doesn't freeze. And so when you drink all the vodka and refill the bottle with water, <laughs> and it's now got a big block of uh-huh. ice in it, uh-huh. someone in the house here is drinking vodka. I wonder it, who that, in my mind, that's one of my classic Casey <laughs> stories yeah, I keep wonder, in my head. wonder yeah. who that could be. <laughs> yeah. Well, if we're going to share a story, so I remember they built this beautiful bar in the downstairs living room of our house. And uh, they, it was a liquor cabinet, and it was stocked with liquor. And... Uh, 
for the first month, it was open. There was no locks on the door. Yeah. And then they threw a party, and everyone's drinks were watered down. Yeah. The next <laughs> month, there was a lock on the door. <laughs> but they left the hinges on the outside. Yeah. Ah, so yeah. a screwdriver got in. So on the third month, there was a lock and hinges all on the inside. And the yeah. security guard. Yeah. <laughs> he, he lived in the back, but he stood by the bar, so it was nice. Well, I guess to wrap this up, you know, a lot of people had asked, uh, you know, how my parents dealt with, you know, my issues and and how they handled it. And I think my dad said it pretty eloquently. He did it to the best of his ability. Yeah. And he tried many things. I think we'll have my mom on coming up in, in some future episodes. But she did the best she could do. My sure. brothers did the best they could do. My ex-wife did the best they could do. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, my kids did. And I want to say, really, from the bottom of my heart, I'm, I'm – I'm sorry, and I'm embarrassed about my actions. And what I can really say is that I'm working hard. I'm giving it all I got to make amends with those. And I've still got a lot of people out there that I've got to make amends to. And the only thing that seems to be working for me right now is this podcast and moving forward. So I can say when I do have a chance to speak to the people that I've hurt and that I've wronged that – Something good is coming out of this, mm-hmm. and it did change. And I'm not the guy that was talking to your shoulder or swinging three times on the golf course or ruining the family reunion. Uh, that was me. I can't say that it wasn't because it was. Yeah, but that's not truly who I am. Uh-huh. I'm 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 a, I'm a good friend. I I love everybody. I really do, and I and I wanna and I wanna. Like I say all the time, I didn't think I'd be in this world, but I'm here, so let's make some noise yeah. and, and do as much good as I can. And if I see you around and I see you out and I owe you an apology, I will, I will give it my best to come up to you and say, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. And um, that wasn't the Casey that you deserved. And unfortunately, that's the Casey you got. And it really breaks my heart. Well, that, I mean, uh, from a friend's perspective, uh, your, your earnest nature – um, your sincerity. Uh, I've always known exactly where I stand with you. Uh, those were the qualities that, you know, over, you know, well, you know, when you got out of rehab that made me know that you were going to be successful in this. And I know that you didn't always know you were going to be successful and that it was, has been a hard year, a well-earned year, but a hard year. But those sorts of qualities, I hope that people listening to what you just said understand that that's that's the real casey that's who you are and i appreciate you and i'm, pr- I'm really proud of you man i am too and i think the thing if i leave it with anything is that what i learned about my dad from the va hospital he can't quit for you that if you have someone in your family who is addicted drugs alcohol whatever it is and you want to confront him and help him don't make it about you how disappointed you are how un pleased you are no it is never ever about you it's about the person with the addiction and they need help and your your job now is not to make it about you but to find someone that can actually help him or her oh that's well said awesome hey thank you dad i I love you and you know i've I've told you this for years Mm -hmm. uh I still kiss my dad on the lips (laughs) love you there it is i love you you just saw (laughs) scott kiss yeah and I did a little backstory. I'm on not that. uncomfortable. That's all right. A little backstory on that. <laughs> um, I was up at college up at Utah State at Sigma Chi, and it was a Father's Day weekend. And my dad came up to see us, you know, and all the dads are there and the parents are there. And we're showing them the house and talking about all the phil- philanthropic work we do uh-huh. and, and, you know, all the good <laughs> stuff that we're doing. And it came to the end of it where the parents are leaving. My dad goes, all right, son, I'm going to go. And I go, hold on. I come and I give him a kiss, and he walks out. And I walk back into a room of fraternity brothers going, what did, <laughs> what did, just, you, what, did, you, did you just kiss your dad on the lips? And yeah. I was like. That was probably a moment of silence for yeah, everybody like, trying to figure you but out. It, but honestly, it was like, yeah. And, and then my next question was like, you guys don't? And they go, no. <laughs> we, no, we don't kiss our dad on the it lips. It was just something that I had always done. Yeah. And it was uh, – predicated on pure emotion yeah. to this day my old i mean his older brother is 49 years old and when i say goodbye i kiss him on the lips hey i sure. love you yeah. and it's just there's nothing there, i think that's, that's great. just who we yeah, are that's great. and it it's helped cement the Somehow bond it really fits your personalities too i it's mean just, i think it's hey, a great expression but everybody goes what was what yeah. what what well it's you know. not common but 
Do you want a kiss on the lips? <laughs> well, yeah, I'm not in the family. I think that's a family thing. <laughs> okay. I feel like I feel your love, though, buddy. I feel I appreciate it. Appreciate it. From a distance. Hey, thanks, everybody, for listening to another episode of Project Recovery. If you know somebody who needs some help, have them do what I did. Give Pinnacle Recovery Center a call. You've been listening to Project Recovery. It's a KSL podcast.